So if somebody's watching this and they don't know Adventure Media, y'all are a big deal. Like you have the highest ranked, not just Google Ads course in Udemy, but it might be the highest ranked digital marketing course. Any business can can run Google Ads profitably. Any business, you know, you sell something online, you should be running Google Ads, you should be running Facebook Ads, whatever. I'm like, like probably not. Like that's not that's not an always always situation because at the end of the day, advertising is a numbers game, and like. Traffic, good traffic is expensive. It always has been. It's your daily Google News. Uh, Kasim here. I'm so excited uh, to introduce you to Patrick Gilbert, the COO of Adventure Media. Patrick, thanks for being here. What's up, Kasim? Thanks for having me, man. Yeah, appreciate you. We met through Fred Vallis, who's my friend of me. Uh, how do you know Fred? Um, we, well, we've been optimizing our customers since the very beginning. Okay. So I think we were like one of the earliest customers of, of Optimizer back in like 2014. Um, and just through the years, just getting to know Fred. I mean, he's been super helpful, super supportive of everything we've done. Dude, so. isn't he just the best human in the world? Like he's I, just amazing. Yeah. 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 And Optimizer's great application, by the way. If you're watching this, you should go check it out. Um, I joke about me and Fred being frenemies only because he and I have different worldviews when it comes to Google ads. And then I always, anytime he has me on his podcast, I feel horrible because I say something and then I stop and realize like, God, I just really threw a grenade at Fred. And he's like, <laughs> he's so kind about the way that he, he adjusts though. Um, before we dive into the fun stuff, you've got a big event coming up, right? Yeah. So, um, we're having, we're, we're entering the event space, adventure media. Uh, we're having an event on November 10th. In New York, uh, we call it DOLA, stands for Day of Learning and Happiness, which is kind of ridiculous, but it was an internal event that we had for like two years now, um, a couple times a year, where it's really just a training event. We kind of open our toolbox, we go through um, case studies, methodologies, frameworks, basically just like how we do the work that we do. So this year we're doing it big. We uh, we have a space in Lower Manhattan. Uh, we're going to be live streaming the event. We're partnering up with New York Festivals, which is an advertising awards company. Oh, wow. uh, we'll live stream it and, and do it awesome. So check it out at adventureppc.com. Um, you'll see a link to the DOLA 22 uh, landing page, but we're, we're tickets online and in person. We'd love to have you come by and meet us and spend a day talking about digital marketing and having a few cocktails at the end of the day, of course. I'll make sure, yeah, exactly. You can't get away without cocktails. I'll make sure there's a link to that in the description. Oh. And for, so if somebody's watching this and they don't know Adventure Media, Y'all are a big deal. Like you have the highest ranked, not just Google ads course in Udemy, but it might be the highest ranked digital marketing course. I think so. And I appreciate that. That really means a lot. Um, yeah, I mean, we've been around for a while. Um, Isaac Rodansky is our CEO. Uh, a lot of people might recognize his name because of that course and a few other things that he's put on over the years. Um, but, you know, like anyone else, like we started out very small. There was a couple of us in a very tiny, disgusting office um, above Isaac's father-in-law's like store that he had and in, in no just trying to get good at you know ppc and originally google adwords and then facebook and a bunch of other things um we're coming in on 10 years now uh, i've been growing the company pretty slowly over time but now we have 40 some odd employees three different offices across the us and a couple of team members worldwide so um yeah we put out a lot of content so isaac has three courses on udemy uh just basic google adwords stuff or google ad stuff uh retargeting and landing page optimization I have a book out, um, if you haven't heard of it, Join or Die, Digital Advertising in the Age of Automation. You can check it out on Amazon. And then, I mean, we're, uh, you know, we always have a lot of blog content, a lot of podcast stuff like this or, or YouTube content. And uh, yeah, no, but Dola is going to be a big deal. I mean, we, we've been, we have not put out a ton of content over the last year. And I think this is our big splash moment of saying, here's what we've been working on, you know, take this and, and come join the conversation. That's awesome. Anybody can sign up or a specific avatar, who are you going for? Uh, to come. So um, we're, I mean, we already have a bunch of people that are listed as attendees. So we have other agencies, but a lot of freelancers showing up. We have some marketing students. So a couple of people are bringing their marketing classes, like from local colleges, like Stony Brook or Hofstra. A um, bunch of people from Google are going to be there. We're going to have people from a couple of other DSPs, like Snap, Yelp's going to be there. Um, so it's just like a, a bunch of marketing minds and advertising minds all in the same room to talk about what's going on in the industry. Dude, it's 179 bucks. That's a oh, yeah. freaking deal. Uh, well, actually, no, it's currently cheaper. Um, we're doing really? a hard thing. Uh, I think it's eighty nine dollars right now. Um, it's a full day. Look, this is our first event, so it's we don't know how this stuff should be priced. Um, but yeah, no, uh, early bird. I think it says the top through October twenty second. 
$89, come spend a full day talking marketing and PPC and advertising with all of us. In That's a deal and a half. And then that live stream again, deal and a half, 29 bucks. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll, we'll make awesome. sure there's a link in the description of the video. People should definitely do that. And then I want people to see your book, uh, join okay. or die. That was on my list, uh, to bring up because first of all, like you really wrote a book. Most people write a book just as a branding thing. I want to get on stage. So you go hire scribe media, you pay them 40 grand. They write a book for you. <laughs> you, you did this, right? Like you're pen to page yeah. and, and then you got like some real traction. 146 ratings, organic ratings is, is that's difficult because one in 50 people, let's say, actually provide a review. So tell me a little bit about the book. Um, I appreciate it. The book. So um, the book essentially chronicles my own journey with understanding automation uh, and, and learning how to use this technology for the purpose of marketing. Because my background, like I'm a marketer, like I went to school for marketing. I've worked in marketing my whole career. Like I wasn't necessarily like a data guy. I wasn't, I, I've never like convinced, tried to convince myself that I'm a statistics whiz, but I think to survive in this modern age, like you need to be able to be proficient in a lot of those areas. Sure. And I was fortunate enough to have a few like mentors um, or a couple, couple like really good product experts at Google that gave me the time of day to really help me understand these methodologies. So like, you don't need to sit here as a marketer and like know the real fundamental, like how the Bayesian machine learning like works. But from a conceptual level, it's actually not that difficult. And if you just kind of start picking up on these topics, um, you unlock all this incredible potential. So like what I started doing back in, let's say 2018 was taking this topic really seriously. And I started writing about it. Hmm. And one blog post turned into five blog posts, which eventually became a book. Blog um, a book. Like pen to paper. Um, I've always had a knack for writing. I love writing. I love creating content. Um, it's sort of like, you know, your own, it's it's my own version of like just yelling out into the void. And uh, it, I, I wanted it to be short. I wanted it to be like, you know, that cheap brand, not cheap brand anything, but you know, I thought it was going to be a small project, ah, maybe 200 pages, whatever. And then as you sat down, I was like, this is my one attempt to get that conversation out there and tell people about how incredible this technology is. I started writing it at the time where like there were still, a, there were a ton of people that were not adopting automation and yeah. they're still, they're still not, but it was like, you know, three, four years ago, it was like really bad. Um, and I was just trying to get the message out into the world and say, not only like, do you have to embrace this technology because that's going away, but like, here's why, like, it's freaking awesome. And if you just know a little bit about a few of these concepts, the potential that you have to drive value for your clients is just otherworldly. Um, and I think that's really where the reception of the book came from is a lot of people, a lot of marketing people like me that didn't really know anything about machine learning before picking up the book, saw it like essentially through my eyes and was like, oh, this is actually practical. This is actually mm -hmm. useful. Um, and I've gotten a lot of really good feedback from it. And uh, there's more to come where that came from. I'll say that. Um, there's also a think, uh, think with Google is doing a spotlight on automation that uh, is going to come out in the next month or two month or so that uh, we do a lot of these types of conversations that um, circle around the topic of automation and what it means to all of us and where the future is going. So keep a lookout for that as well. That's so that uh, that's my favorite topic of all time, by the way. And obviously in our itinerary here, as far as automation is concerned, because I was one of the reluctant adopters, like very reluctant, jag kicking and screaming. And now I, I see the line of sight that's been established, especially with performance max. But I question certain media buyers' longevity. Like, I know the agency is always going to be a necessity. You know what I mean? Um, always. And I think it's going to move into data analytics, some creative, depending on how AI influences creative. But there's like the old school, you know, daily tweak, turn my knobs and pull my levers media buyer. Like, is there, is there a role for them three, five years from now? probably not and honestly like dude what an honest answer thank you for that patrick i that really is, appreciate you dude. Right. but you know what though like so a lot of like i went to the hubspot's inbound conference in 2016 um i'll never forget it because it was the night of the 2016 election it was like terrible timing to have a conference wait is that where uh ta-nehisi coates got up and like st and stole the mic it was uh, i was there you were Dude, there? That's so funny. Yeah. What a weird, yeah. What a small world. That was a wild conference because it was for so many reasons, but that was awesome because so um, that was really, 
that was like kind of a week where I started to realize like this AI thing is real and it's yeah. practical for me and it's not going anywhere. Paul Rowitzer, um, who's a PR 2020, he he um, he announced the Marketing AI Institute at that conference. So there was like a lot of like the seeds of what is now transpired it kind of goes back to that one event. And it was like totally right. Me, Isaac and, and our, uh, our other colleague, Danny to wheel were like there as a bunch of like young idiots, but, but Gary Vaynerchuk gave the, gave the keynote. Yep. Um, and like, say what you like, you know, Gary V is very polarizing, but Gary he's like, Gary oh, v. yeah. Yeah. He's hilarious in a lot of ways, but whatever your thoughts are, there was something that always stuck with me. And he said, um, if you're not trying to put yourself out of business, somebody else will. Wow. And now I was sitting That's there. That's a writer downer, isn't it? I was, I was working, you know, at Adventure for probably two years at that point. And I thought that we were this, you know, innovative, scrappy, we're going to take the business from someone else. And like on our drive home from Boston, like at the end of the week, I was like thinking about that and being like, you know what? Like maybe like what I'm doing isn't going to last forever. And maybe I should start thinking about like putting myself out of business. So like, if you think about it, yes, like that media buyer that I was in 2016 doesn't exist. There's no role for that person. But thankfully, I replaced that person. So I was the beneficiary of it. And mm. that, like working in marketing or anything related to technology, it's exhausting. And like, it's daunting to think about the, like, I'm still a relatively young guy. Like the future of my career is going to have to include like multiple reinventions. That's every two years, the right? That, like, the thought of that is terrifying because it's exhausting to just constantly yeah. do new stuff. Um, like if, you know, if you want to just be like a, a, I don't know, there's, there's a lot of industries out there that don't change very much. Um, and that sounds pretty enticing, but like, Dude, I want to be a stonemason at this point. Like, I just want to go. Cause that, you know, it's 2000 years of longevity there. Nothing's changed. Same tools, right. But yeah. like, if you want to exist in this industry, you have to continue to iterate and, uh, you have to have the energy and the perseverance to be able to do that again and again. How do you know the difference though, between shiny object and evolution? Because I, I, and I've been caught on the wrong side of both. You know what I mean? I've been caught on like, I remember, dude, actually speaking to Gary V, I remember when Gary V came to Icon and started talking about Snapchat and he was so convincing about this is the thing. This is yep. going to destroy Facebook. It's the next wow. social evolution. If you're not Snapchatting, it's over for you. And, I, and I'm, I'm pulling up and I look old and I'm like, you know, trying to figure out this freaking thing. And now it's, a, it's massively irrelevant. But I spent so much time trying to crack the code on this thing that was worthless. And then things like, you know, the, the, the AI Marcon that I just didn't pay attention to until very close to my own detriment was the, so I, I you know, shiny object and evolution. How do you, how do you wow. distill between those two? There's like no right answer. I think that all of us are going to continue to be wrong and you just have to be right sometimes. I think that like stepping back and thinking about why those sorts of things catch on. Hmm. Um, so like, if, if you want to talk about like, okay, where, where are things going and where are we at and how to, how to be mindful of that? Like there's like these like cyclical things, like we could sit here and talk about inflation or election cycles. And like, I think that, that sort of like what's happening right now or today, that's, I think where you get caught up in the shiny object stuff, or it's like all these people are flooding to this platform. And it's like, all right, like, let me watch this for a little bit. Um, and there's implications, right? So like, if you want to talk about like what's happening in the world right now, what are the changes? Like, okay, like what are the larger macro trends? Like mm. one of them that I'm aware of is like, okay, well, there's a lot of money. There's like the VC money is dried up compared to where it was three, four years ago. And I think there's implications for what that means for clients and um, expectations and certain types of players that dominate you know, ad auctions, whatever. And there's a lot Ooh, more brilliant money. Brilliant point. So that means like less ingenuity and more tried and true, right? Like when money goes safe, the market shifts to commoditized, but consistent yes. monetization. That's a freaking brilliant, brilliant what point. What we've seen is there's a big push now toward private equity. And we now have a couple of clients that they're large private equity firms that buy up a lot of cash rich, small local services, things like plumbers, HVAC, tire repair stores, things like that, tried and true methodologies. Yeah. And like, you're looking at us saying, okay, we need a playbook for how to roll out relatively small budgets across a, a spectrum of 300 brands and all these different markets. And how do we do that consistently? And that's very different from a, a, a VC backed client that's trying to 
acquire customers at some sort of arbitrary CAC number that like one of their board members decided, you know, they came up with in a weird Excel document. Now, we both fought of that, that battle really so many times, dude. Exactly. And like, we still have those clients. Yeah. We still have plenty of those clients, but I think you just kind of see these things shift. But anyway, that is shiny object stuff. Like if I was to say like, oh, well, we're all in on private equity and we're out on everything else. Like, I think that would be shiny object. That would be a mistake. The real thing here in terms of like looking at the trends of the future is really paying attention to what's happening with technology because technology does not go backwards. It only goes forward. Mm -hmm. And that is why I was like so willing to like buy into the automation piece years ago when everyone, and, and I too, like I also was drag kicking and screaming because like it failed for me and I was worried about my job and worried about the value that I would have if all of my campaigns are running on automation. Um, but then you, I, you kind of wake up with names and be like, all right, like this isn't going away. So like, maybe it's good. Maybe it's different. Yeah. What happens if I lean into it? What happens if I lean into it? And I think so, like, I don't know. I think that just what's happening with AI right now is so fascinating. Like I'm more excited over the last couple of months about the state of AI than I have been in, in a couple of years now. Um, and, and the thing about AI, by the way, is that we kind of use it as this term is like, it's in the future, but like by the time it becomes something practical, we don't call it that. So like, it's like, oh man, could you imagine an AI bot that just like organizes the, all the information on the internet? And then like you do a search and it gives it to you. Like that's Google search or like it's Spotify's discover weekly engine or it's auto applied recommendations in Google. Like we never call it AI. It's just something that's fed to us. But dude, well, hold on. You just got to pause right there, Patrick. Cause that was fucking genius. And I actually try not to curse on this channel. Um, <laughs> No, what a brilliant point. There's a funnel to all things AI. And, and while it can't be understood, it's opaque or it's ill-defined, we refer to it as AI. Yeah. And as soon as we integrate it, we actually remove the AI label. Yeah. And that's, that's the event horizon. That's how you know something is, is, is tangible. Like we've got the controls and we understand it because we no longer call it, even though it is, we no longer call it AI. There's a lot I've of things like that. Spent time thinking about that but that is really worth meditating on this is not a glitch i'm interrupting the video you're watching because i need to remind you that i'm always looking for people to join our team so if you're passionate about google ads and you want to work with the best google ads agency on the planet please go to solate.com forward slash apply speaking of working with the best google ads agency on the planet if you're having trouble with google ads and you want professional help that's what we do you can go to solate.com that's s-o-l-8.com to apply for your free no obligation action plan and if i've given you any level of value at all maybe think about giving me a thumbs up and subscribing to our channel that's how we juice the youtube algorithm so they actually know that i know what i'm talking about if you have questions comments concerns or confessions hit me below in the comments and now back to your regularly scheduled program i think metaverse is the same idea like i think all of us in a way like right now like you and i are in a metaverse we're, we're on zoom right now like is this super different from like what people are thinking about as the future like it doesn't have to be fully fledged vr headset like this is still that um, but the second it's, it's, oh, that's just zoom. Do you have a podcast? Uh, not well, yes, we do how to hide a dead body. Um, but Isaac okay. and I have not recorded in a while. Dude, uh, I would we, listen to you every day. Like you just said so <laughs> many things that I'm a fanboy. Of. How to hide a dead body, how to hide, how, how to hide a dead body, which that's the old hey, joke two of Google. Yeah. Yeah. That's so good. Uh, name. Yeah. We haven't recorded. It's been probably a year. Um, oh you're killing me well i'll link to that in the description of the show notes too yeah, we so, have some, check out the archives of that there's some good stuff in there i bet there yeah that's really cool um most of our listeners are either small businesses trying to run google as themselves or agencies yeah i want to talk to the small businesses first here's my fear for them and this is what i've seen and you tell me if i'm wrong pmax rolls out the beta is 2019 but really the rollout's november 2021 and as soon as it rolls out, we used to be able to take clients that had three, four, five grand a month spend. That was a healthy spend. I can't take a client now that's sub 10. If they're sub 10, we call them our incubator program. And then it's shoestring and it's dangerous and it may not work. I feel like AI works really well if you've got a healthy budget. But the entire SMB world, and we'll see what happens with Pmax now that took over local, putting that on a shelf for a moment though. If you've got a small budget, I feel like AI programmatic machine learning whatever it it you can't play so possibly so i, I think first of all like to, to unpack that question or that point really there's like a fundamental assumption in that statement 
that says like, if you have a smaller budget, you're at a disadvantage. And I, and I would agree with that. Like any, any advertiser that has a smaller budget than the next player is at a disadvantage. Now, be, and, and as much as we want to tell us like, oh, it's a level playing field, shout out Fred's book that's right behind me. Um, and you know, uh, Google ads is a, is a place where everyone can bid on the same keyword. Like it's not because like, I don't know, like here's a, a Texas Instruments calculator, right? If I if I was a D2C brand that just, you know, invented a new calculator and I bid on the, you know, keyword like financial calculator and the cost per click is whatever it is. Texas Instruments can afford to pay more per click because people are familiar with that brand and right. expected conversion rate on that click, even if I have the greatest landing page in the world, it's going to be higher for them because they've done the branding, they have the impact. So like, it's not a level playing field. A lot of people, a lot of performance marketers like myself, historically have always thrown shade on the concept of brand awareness and brand equity. But it freaking matters, man, because that's why like, when you're a small business, you can't compete. Now, or okay, you can't compete at scale. You can't be, well, and that's why Ty Lopez and those guys are running around buying all those defunct brands. Do you, yeah. see, do you see what they did? They bought Radio Shack. They threw a bunch of like bullshit drop ship it's electronics so under the Radio Shack umbrella and dude, they flew off the shelf. It yeah. was the same stuff. You'd never be able to drop ship otherwise, but if you put a Radio Shack logo on it, they're like crushing life. Absolutely. And like, so, so now that methodology, I think like if I put myself in, in when I'm, you know, pitching small businesses and like, let's say it was five grand, right. Cause that number has always kind of been, you know, we're going to pick a number and, and it's going to differ because like, if you're, if you're a, you know, if you're drop shipping like goofy t-shirts with like pop culture references on it and it's like, all right, cool. Like five grand is probably plenty for you to get started on like Facebook ads or Google ads, whatever. Hmm. Uh, but if you're like, if you have a SaaS product, like get out, of, get out of here. Like if you don't have a hundred grand, like it's not worth, it's not worth a penny. Right. It's either it's put a hundred grand in or it's not worth a penny. So like that number, I think has always been a little bit arbitrary. And I think it's always just been about like, what, what do we think that like agencies can get away with pitching so that we can set expectations? Because all of us kind of know that you're at a disadvantage with a smaller budget. So I need to be able to go to the client and convince them that it's not worth your time unless it's about, and you throw out a number and it's like, I hope they don't, they don't shock value. So like we've increased that number like years ago, maybe it was a thousand bucks, maybe it was 2000 bucks. What shows like, minimum right now? Uh, I don't know. It depends on, it depends on the brand. It depends on the, the sure. product. You know what I mean? Like, I think it's really hard to work with someone below 10 grand. In, right. in um, But there's also, there's other pieces of that because like the kind of service that we want to provide is like, we want to be able to do really cool reporting and all these other things that kind of come with costs. Um, but yeah, like I, so whatever that number is to really answer your question, like it's probably like, it's probably double what it was two years ago. Right. Like if it was like, Hey, listen, baseline entry to Google ads was five grand in 2020 it's probably 10 grand now. Like that's just the reality of it because like it's, it's hard. Um, you need to be able to put, because at the end of the day, advertising is a numbers game and like traffic, good traffic is expensive. It always has been. Um, and you can't afford to just in any business, you can't afford to just be like, ah, oh, I'm going to like test this channel and get 10 clicks a day, or I'm going to get, and maybe I'll convert one person every other day like you have to like really think about like what is a realistic conversion rate that i can get on my website like like good good brands like the best e-commerce brands in the world have like a one to two percent conversion rate if that mm. so it's like okay so you're getting 80 clicks a day from your google ad campaigns so you're going to convert less than a person a day like the math just doesn't check out so now if it's like, okay, well, I want to be able to feed good data into the system to be able to leverage target return on ad spend bidding or to leverage maximize conversion value and performance max campaign, like the math just doesn't check out. Like that's not, that's no fault of the automation. That's no fault of Google's machine learning. That's the fault of just like not having the budget to quantify enough data. Yeah, you didn't feed it enough. Yeah. Yeah, that's well said. Uh, it, it worries me because I feel like we're putting ourselves in a position where um, there was an organic ecosystem within which an entrepreneur really could bootstrap themselves. And, and now it feels like there's, it's not, it's not insurmountable. 10 grand a month. Forgive me for saying this for anybody listening to this. Who's like, you know, screw you, dude. Like I'm, you know, driving an Uber, working nights and weekends, trying to pull myself up. I know 10 grand a month is a lot of money, but it's accessible. Like we can go get it. If you believe in a product or service, 
but it's getting very close to inaccessible. You know what I mean? Like 10, I'm like, all right, somebody could be, but 15. And, and, and then you put yourself in a position where the visibility has gotten so expensive that w- where do you go? What do you do? So I think what I've been guilty of in the past and what I think, like, I think we're all guilty of like the Maslow's hammer effect, which is like when all you're holding is a hammer, everything starts to look like a nail. Yeah. And like, I, I, I believed that for a very long time that like any, yeah, any, any business can, can run Google ads profitably. Any business, you know, you sell something online, you should be running Google ads, you should be running Facebook ads, whatever. And like, like probably not. Like that's not that's not an always always situation. Um, and that's I think a good point, like, dude. They can go elsewhere, right? It's like get organic, provide yeah. value, start a YouTube channel, do a podcast. You know, I mean, like it's because unreal it's how We're much true. visibility we get from our organic action. It's 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 tedious, yeah. but it's free. Our company doesn't do any Google ads. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's awesome. Because like like I don't know, need like, to. Do you guys? Uh, we we spend a significant amount in Google. Yeah, actually, you know what's funny? It's not Google search, it's all YouTube. We spend like 75 grand a month on YouTube. Exactly. Yeah. And like well, and, and that goes back to my original point. Like you can afford to spend because look, I've seen what cost per click is for like you know PPC agency. Oh, we can't do search. It's just yeah, right. every idiot on the planet just goes out there and maximizes conversions. It doesn't make but, any sense. But that's the thing though, is like you might be able to, and you might be able to profitably do that because you have this YouTube channel, because you spend money everywhere else. So it's like all those other things where it's like, oh, I've seen that guy. Oh, that's the guy with the long hair. I've seen his performance max thing. Subtly, now it's like, okay, soul8.com. And then like a bunch of, you know, three other agencies that's people in their mom's basement that are overpaying for clicks. And like the likelihood of somebody clicking on your ad is incrementally higher. And the likelihood of them reaching out to you and, and asking for an audit is incrementally higher. And it's not like binary. It's not yes or no. It's we're talking about like expected click through rate and right. expected conversion rate. And because you've done the work to help build a presence and a halo effect before that person gets to Google and searches for PPC agency, now you can afford to do that. Maybe, maybe not because it's still freaking expensive. It's still super, You know what's funny about that though? There's, there's something to be said for being um, visually identifiable. Uh, you know, Tom Breeze, YouTube guru. Uh, yeah, yeah, I've seen his stuff. Super smart guy. Tom did an audit on my YouTube uh, account. One of the things that we identified in that audit is when my hair is down, my watch rate is higher. And it's, I think it's just because people are like, oh yeah, I know, I know that guy. And when my hair is up, I look like maybe just every other dude. But I've seen like Rand Fishkin, you know, he looks like a pirate and you know Rand and you know Ezra yeah. Firestone, you know Isaac Radansky, you know, I, I, he's always got a beanie on. Yeah, yeah. so you, he puts himself in a position to where, like you said, it, 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 I used to be so dismissive of brand too, but now I get it, man. Like it's really important. Have you ever seen Scott Galloway stuff? Oh yeah. So yeah. Scott Galloway, NYU. Google is God. There. What's that? Google is God. Yeah. Yeah. Very like <laughs> talk about somebody that has no, uh, has no filter on his political views and how he feels about large brands, but, but he is very transparent. I mean, he's got some really good career advice if you kind of dig through everything else. And he says, like, the best thing you can do is have a visual aesthetic to your brand. And he and he had said, like, he was losing his hair at some point, and he just, like, shaved his head. Yeah. He's like, I'm going to be the bald guy with the big glasses that's yelling about how, you know, how bad Facebook is for the world. And that sticks. Yeah, I don't have, it really I does. I figure out what that's going to be for me, but we'll get there. Yeah. Well, I don't know, man. The world is your oyster right now. As far as, I'm going to pivot on you real quick because I, I, I want to make sure I don't pass this up. And there was a, 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 a opportunity to pursue it previous and i'm just a horrible interviewer as you can tell because i get so excited um attribution Mm -hmm. i I think it's a trillion dollar problem i think whoever cracks the code on attribution is going to like own the media space right now as far as i'm concerned and i'd love if you have a solution because i don't think you know high rows wicked reports triple well i don't think any of those work at least not well enough to rely on as a single source of truth what are y'all doing for attribution and what do you see coming down the pipe that could either help or hurt I don't think there's ever going to be an actual solution. I think that hopefully we'll all get more mature at how we talk about it. Um, Mm -hmm. I think that one of the big things that we need to do as an industry is change the way that we measure goals and how we set goals. Um, Because like being held to the return on ad spend column, I think is like ridiculous because it's, it's, it's a proxy for profit. It doesn't actually show profit. 
Um, and there's writer down or hold on the, 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 the ROAS column is a proxy for profit. And, and like, this sounds, oh my God, it's like, it's like Monday morning quarterback. Like it sounds so simple, but like, what, what is the percentage of clients that I've worked on over the years that like, I actually don't know how profit is calculated in the business. And like, it's sad because like, people tell you all the time, like, oh, we have 35% margins or like whatever it is. Like, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying like, show me the books right. on what goes into putting money in your bank account when you close at the end of the day. Show me that. And then I'll work backwards and show you 15 different scenarios, how we can make that number larger. And it might come at, you know, a, a one times return on ad spend. It might come at a 10 times return on ad spend. And there's all these different ways to do it. And I'll tell you, my biggest client right now, the one that I've spent more time on than any other client, they're, um, the, any, any larger business that you work with, there's more and more attribution problems. Right. The smaller company, the easier it is. Like, oh, I spent 10 grand in Google and I got all this business and I'm not doing any other marketing. It's never heard of me. But if you're working on a larger brand, it's more complicated. And the data that this brand in particular has is not only completely disjointed, but there's certain like compliance issues with the industry they're in that like you just can't get it. So what we do is we create models that we know are extremely flawed and extremely imperfect but they're good enough to help us steer marketing decisions in the right area. Like, for example, we know we do a bunch of Yelp advertising for this client. We know that Yelp is driving a ton of their business, even though the model that we're using is not give, giving it nearly enough credit. But it doesn't mean that we're spending any less. Like, we're mm. still driving it home because at the end of the day, and this is really the part of the attribution problem, like, there's still rationale and gut instinct. And it's like, listen, like, I'm not seeing the data being reported in my Facebook campaigns, but I know that they're that those re, those Facebook remarketing ads are are helping drive conversions. Like it's not there, and it's not saying it's profitable, but I know that if I turn them off, my actual sales are going to dry up. Like there's a lot of intuition that's going to have to come, even if we have the world's greatest attribution solution. At a practical level, what we are doing is, in a lot of cases, developing our own data driven attribution solution oh good for you guys we, are you gonna uh, turn that into a SaaS product or keep it proprietary god i would i mean i would love to no it's 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 you know, so this is the crazy thing about data-driven attribution it's just a math equation like it's not it's not proprietary because if you actually look up where this concept came from um it's oh my god i should call the comment in here to actually describe this because she'll go crazy on it but but we first of all we have a blog post on our on our website that talks about it like that that just outlines how we did it for for a different client um, but it's based off of this model from game theory that is based on three different principles of like how you assign credit for a decision or an action. Um, and it's basically as if it's like the laws of physics. And it's like, if, and it, it's really a measure of incrementality uh, for different interactions that you have. And if you can just build this math problem and then say, okay, well, this person viewed a Facebook ad, but then they clicked on a Google ad and then they clicked on a second Google ad. And there's, there's actually an equation that you could just say, okay, well, therefore we're going to split it up in this way, this way, like Google's data-driven attribution is not a black box. Like a lot of people are like hesitant to adopt DDA because mm. they think Google's going to game the system to like spit out numbers that are going to convince you to spend more money. That's complete bullshit. DDA is literally a very open and close, like just look at the numbers of how they, how they write it. It's no different from how position-based is 40, 40, 20. Right. Um, it's, just, it's more complicated and most people like me that aren't mathematicians don't really understand it. So that's essentially what you can do is if you can get that data and say, okay, well, we're going to use a solution like CM360 or we're going to use view through data um, or we're going to use, I think GA4 actually has a lot of these solutions built in. And then we're going to pull all this into a, a Excel sheet and we're going to make our own data driven attribution model and assign credit accordingly. And then do a gut check and say, does this logically make sense? And therefore, that's how we're going to distribute our budget. That's essentially what we've been doing. And I think it's been working really well. That's really brilliant. Where we struggle is, you know, first party data is accessible to you. So you can get most click. It's all view. It's, you know, the, the entire top of the funnel, top and middle of the funnel is basically effectively entirely opaque, especially after iOS 14, but not just because of iOS 14. Wow. You're seeing like, yeah, there's a whole bunch of things that reasons that you lose that data. Um, but I love what you said about making multivariant. And the other thing that you also did too is, 
you just gave the whole media buyers that we put out of business 20 minutes ago, you gave them a new job. They have a whole new job. Oh, like, yeah. Parsing this stuff is like so important. It's so valuable because, well, first of all, like you want to talk about proxies again, like some people have like really made up their mind on the value of view through. And it's just, it's so asinine to me because they're like, oh, well, they didn't click on that Facebook ad. And it's like, who the fuck cares? Like, <laughs> sorry, my lots of curse. Probably better. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, you got better. three like, impressions. Google's on a 500 touch point paradigm. You know what I mean? You have what? to get to 500. When was the last time you clicked on an advertisement? Right. Facebook, Google, otherwise. I don't care. Um, but, but the reality of it is like, um, we're using clicks as our proxy for engagement or interaction or interest or whatever you want to call it. But like, that doesn't mean anything. Cause then you also could make the same argument about accidental clicks and my kids watching YouTube on my iPad and all this other stuff that like, it's, a, it's all nonsense. So the real conversation here is like, okay, listen, we know that if somebody viewed an ad, like, it, like a view is still not as valuable as a click. Like I'll agree with that hundred mm. percent, but it's not completely not valuable. It's not worth less, right? Not worth less. It's worth yeah. greater than zero. Yeah. So can we come up with a, a best guess about that overall value? And it'll change depending on where it is in the ecosystem. If it's your first touch, it's probably a lot more valuable than your last touch. And it changes depending on the quantity of interactions. If you've had two interactions and one was a click on a Google ad, and then the second was a view on a Facebook ad, and then they converted, you could argue that that probably had a lot more value than if they had 35 interactions and the last one was a view on a Facebook ad. Mm. The incrementality there is probably much less. And with a little bit of like weekend math work, you can actually prove that. You can measure the incrementality of that 35th interaction and say, you compare it to the same string. This is actually how DDA works, right? So we actually want to talk technical for a second. The way you measure this is you look at all interactions, let's say it's a it's a it's a Google ad click and then a Facebook re remarketing view. Um, you look at the actual conversion rate of those interactions that you've had. So you have to get a lot of conversion data first. Right. Yeah, well, we had um, you know, we had a hundred people that had this path on the website, and there was we had a 10% conversion rate. So we had 10 people of that path convert. Um, but when we pull away that last interaction. And we say, how many people just had that one Google ad click and never had that secondary interaction? And then you say, okay, well, the conversion rate there, we had, uh, we had 100 people click and only eight people converted. So that's an 8% conversion rate for the interaction. So that delta of that, um, well, it's, it's not 2%, it's, it's really 20% um, from 8 to 10%. Sure. Um, so that 20%, that, that means that that Facebook view through conversion has a 20% value of the overall conversion value. It gives you a 20% lift. That is how data-driven attribution works. Like that is the simplest version of it because at scale, it's not that simple. It's people have like, I mean, you've probably seen your path reports, right? Well, people it's multivariant too. There's so just- So crazy. Yeah. So that's why it's really hard to measure this stuff, but like, that's just how it works. And if you can do this yourself, you kind of come up with a gut feeling of like, eh, maybe that's a little bit more valuable, a little bit less valuable. Do you do private consulting, Patrick, if people wanted to work with you? Uh, yeah, I mean, at our company, we do like, there's, um, there's people much more intelligent and knowledgeable about this stuff than I do, but we, we have, uh, almost 50% of our client base at this point is like just pure consulting. We work with in-house brands. We work with, um, a, a lot of people that run their ad campaigns themselves, or just like, Hey, I know that, you know, my campaigns are up and running. They're profitable. I just need someone to like, make sure that I'm not screwing up my performance max implementation. Can you like help me not screw this up? So we do a lot of consulting. Do that. So we don't do any consulting. So we should just send our consulting because we get a ton of requests for it. We only do services. They just go to you. Yeah. That'd be fantastic. I, I, I love the consulting work because like to be able to sit and talk shop and not necessarily like be worried about uh, like, like, okay, well now we're going to make a decision just on our side without access to all the, like you're really making a decision together with the client, um, which I, I really like that sort of thing. Cause there's always a different perspective. Um, yeah. So consulting clients send them our way. I love it. Dude, you're easily one of the smartest people I've ever talked to. This was awesome. I'd love to do it again. If I, you don't mind me exhausting your timetable, I'd also love to get you on perpetual traffic. I'm going to go pitch you up to them too. 
Um, yeah. I love, uh, look, shooting the breeze, but with brilliant people like yourself, Kasim, is like my favorite thing in the world. This is a very isolating business that we live in. Is it a air? <laughs> the human condition with other people and gripe and talk about all the different challenges is like, it's extremely therapeutic and it's my favorite thing to do. Yeah, it's mine too. So we've got the Dola event that people have to check out for no money, by the way, if I was going to criticize one thing, I'd be like, essentially free. yeah, it's essentially free. That's exactly right. So if you're anywhere near New York, go in person. If you're not, go get yes. the $29, whatever pass, uh, check out Patrick's book, uh, link in the show notes. Last words to you, sir. Uh, the, the last words are never, always, never, never. That's my mantra that there's, there's not just one thing that works every time. Everything has a, a million different reasons why it might work. And, and that's the fun of marketing is that there's, there's always, you, you can do everything right. And something might still go wrong. And that's what keeps us coming back. So never, always, never, 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 always, never, never. I love it. I've got a bunch of writer downers from you. Really appreciate you being on here, brother. Thank you. Thanks, Kostin. This is a blast. Yeah. If you're watching, I shoot a video every day, like, comment, subscribe, and I'll see you tomorrow. Welcome to your daily Google news. I'm your host, Custom, And I'm, I'm so excited to speak with Ed Leak, the Google that super freak. <laughs> I hey, swear to God, that was an accident. You, you said John was the, the, the guy, the Google guy, not me. Yeah, Ed is at least in the top two smartest Google guys on the planet.